Rorangitira ma. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Charles Doherty, and I'm your master of ceremonies for the next two days. A wel warm welcome to all 400 of you who have registered for this event. The initiative for this conference arose from last year's Transit of Venus Forum in Gisborne. The forum was a national event, the vision of the late Sir Paul Callahan, and it focused broadly on the future of New Zealand. Perhaps the most surprising and welcome aspect for me was to hear a common message from the economists at that meeting. The message was that the foundation of economic well-being and national development is a healthy environment. For many decades earlier, we heard quite a different story that caring for the environment required economic growth and national wealth first. Once we're wealthy, as the story went, then perhaps we can care for the environment, but conservation was not a priority. Last year, instead, we heard the welcome message that environmental well-being is the essential partner, not the poor sibling, of economic well-being and development. What a wonderful change. You might remember Bill Clinton's campaign mantra in 1992, it's the economy, stupid. Well, the economy matters, but the message is different now. It's the environment and the economy, stupid. For the next two days, the speakers and panel members at this event will explore what that means for New Zealand. The best thing about the Transit Forum was that different sectors of society engaged openly and directly with one another about our collective futures. This conference offers the same opportunity with over 400 registrants from business, IWI, government, universities, and other sectors of society. I hope all of you enjoy hearing and learning about new perspectives, meeting new people, and taking another step along this journey where we learn more about societal well-being in that larger context of the economy and the environment. Welcome support for this conference comes from the Alan Wilson Center for Molecular Ecology and Evolution, the Bioprotection Research Center, Waikato University, and the National Institute for Water and Atmospheric Research. On behalf of all the primary sponsors, I extend a warm welcome to all of those, the delegates from those organizations. And of course, the conference is possible because of the sponsoring partnership between Victoria University of Wellington and the New Zealand Government Natural Resources Sector, which includes the Department of Conservation, the Department of Internal Affairs, Land Information New Zealand, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, the Ministry for the Environment, the Ministry for Primary Industries, and Te Puni Kokiri, and all of those in association with the Sustainable Business Council. Thank you all. So to begin, we have a marvelous introduction to set the scene courtesy of that wonderfully creative New Zealander, Ian Taylor of Taylor Made Productions. Thank you, Ian. The brief introduction that you're about to see does honor to this wonderful theater, this city uh, and the launch, well, this wonderful theater, which is the launch pad for creative endeavors uh, of, of all New Zealanders, valuing nature among them. In the beginning, there was Tekore, the nothingness. Out of this great nothingness came Tepo, the night. Tepo Roa, the long night. Tepo Nui, the great night. Eventually came Te Ata, the dawn. Ranginui, the Sky Father, with his beloved Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother, in his arms. One of their children, Tane Mahuta, forced them far apart, the Sky Father above, the Earth Mother below. As the universe was created, so was the land. Ko tēnei te kōrero a Maui tiki tiki a Taranga me te waka a Maui. Maui. Maui the favoured son, Maui born with magical powers, Maui the trickster, Maui the fisherman. 
Maui said to his brothers, you must paddle far out to sea. Paddle out to Taunga Ika, the great fishing grounds. Hoi ara te waka ne. And so they paddled far out to sea, so far out to sea, that all sight of land was lost. Ah, said Maui, ko te nei te wahi. This is the place. Takumata, said Maui, my fish hook. Maui made the fish hook from the jawbone of his grandmother. Kafua e Maui tana aho. Maui cast his line. on the fishing line was the signal. Oh, where, cried his brothers. He has a good catch of fish. He ika nui kuriru yaho, cried Maui. I have a great fish. He ya he ya he ya te ika nui, chanted Maui. Pull, pull, pull the great fish. So it was that Maui did indeed catch a great fish. Te Ika a Maui, the fish of Maui, became the North Island of New Zealand. Auraki and his brothers left on a voyage to visit their earth mother Papa Tuanuku when disaster struck. Their waka became stranded upon a reef in the ocean. To save themselves, they climbed on top of the great canoe, and the cold south wind froze them, turning them to stone. And so the great land was born. The great waka became the South Island of New Zealand. The brothers became particular mountains and peaks of Ka Tiritiri o Te Moana, the Southern Alps and Auraki, the tallest of the brothers, became its highest peak, standing proud. Auraki, the guardian, Auraki Te Atua. Now we come to Te Moana o Raukawa, or Cook Strait. Tokurie, behold, there is the Upoko Te Ika a Maui, or the head of Maui's fish. Wellington Harbour is the mouth of the fish, Te Waha o Te Ika, also known as Te Whanganui a Tara, or the Great Harbour of Tara. Tara, who came with his father Fatunga and brother Tautoki from Mahia to establish a settlement here. Over time, the Great Harbour became a home to many iwi groupings, and today we acknowledge the mana of Taranaki Whanganui ki te Upoko Te Ika and Ngāti Toa Rangatira over Te Moana, the sea, and Te Whenua, the land. The rich heritage of Māori settlement is continued by the many iwi of Aotearoa and Te Waiponamu, who have defined the landscape, the seascape, and the people with their tikanga, their customs, beliefs, and traditions. Today, a new generation of our people call to you, welcome you. Tihei Māori Ora. 
e ngā iwi o ngā hau e whā kua hui hui mai nei i tēnei rā, tō mātou manakitanga he tohu aroha kia koutou katoa. To all the peoples of the world who have gathered here today, our hospitality is our gift to you. Haere mai, no mai, welcome. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the Minister of Conservation, the Honorable Nick Smith, and invite him to formally open this conference. Minister. Kira Huhiwi Tato Katoa, difficult to compete uh, with Taylor. Uh, the challenge of pulling together good environment and economic policy has been a passion of mine for my 25 years in politics, and so I'm delighted to formally open this Valuing Nature Conference. I want to start by acknowledging our distinguished international guests, former chair of the IPCC on climate change and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Professor Sir Robert Watson, uh, ambassador of the UN Environment Programme and author of Towards a Green Economy, Pavan Sukadev, local government of Environment Sustainability Africa advisor and UN Habitat's local editor, Marlene Laros, and Natural Capital's Managing Director from the World Business Council for Sustainable De Development, James Griffith. This mix of international speakers is matched by our own distinguished thinkers from the spheres of business, the public sector, academia and politics. I particularly want to acknowledge Business New Zealand Chief Executive Phil O'Reilly my own departmental head, Al Morrison, Wellington Mayor, Celia Wade-Brown, and our MC, Charles, from Victoria University. The ambition of this conference is to bring together the conversations on what makes a successful economy with what makes for a well-managed environment. Too often, these discussions occur in different rooms. For New Zealand, it is a no-brainer. We are more dependent than any other developed nation on the wise stewardship of our natural environment for our economic success. Our successful dairy industry is leveraged off copious volumes of fresh, clean water. Our fishing industry of a vast, temperate ocean. Our tourism industry off the breathtaking landscapes and a stunning variety of unique flora and fauna, our horticulture of rich, fertile volcanic soils. This interdependence is going to become a lot more of a global story. I was born into a world with one billion people living the good life in the developed world and four billion in developing nations living in poverty. If I live to a ripe old age, the world is likely to be the home of 10 billion people with about 8 billion enjoying first world living standards. This has massive implications for the demand on resources, impacts on the environment and pressure on the natural world. Now I don't subscribe with those whose response to this challenge is to oppose ongoing economic growth. This Club of Rome type thinking belongs back in the 1970s. The economic growth of the last 40 years has seen hundreds of millions of people lifted out of extreme poverty and we should aspire to repeat that over the next 40 years. Nor does the evidence support low or no growth benefiting the environment. We see some of the worst environmental degradation in impoverished nations. The future lies with those with the nous to find ways of marrying together economic growth with responsible environment stewardship. Uh, Blue Greens, a pro-growth, pro-environment policy group within National, believes there are four key steps to charting this sort of future for New Zealand. The first is robust environment reporting. New Zealand, like most nations, 
spends in excess of a billion dollars a year on accountants and auditors in both the public and private sector tallying up our financial assets. But we spend a fraction of that on monitoring and reporting on our natural assets. This is not a case for putting a dollar value on everything. It's nonsensical to try and do a dollar valuation on something like clean water, the Kakapo, or the Abel Tasman National Park. What we need, alongside GDP, is regular, comprehensive environmental reporting that tells us the state of our natural capital. One of New Zealand's most important natural assets is our plentiful fresh water. But try getting a comprehensive report on it. Every council measures it differently, if at all. Legislative reform currently before Parliament will at last give us the capacity to get some consistency in reporting. Information on the status of our thousands of endangered species is equally about as thin. We can't make good choices if we don't know what we're losing. That is why DOC has embarked on a new system for monitoring and reporting biodiversity. It's part of the government's new environment domain plan being developed by Statistics New Zealand and launched this month. Improved reporting sounds like a very dry topic, but it's a powerful tool for getting better results. New Zealand a generation ago had some of the worst public finance reporting systems of any OECD country, and awful public finances to match. The Fiscal Responsibility Act and its transparent reporting requirements has been a game changer, and through governments of both political persuasions has seen New Zealand now having some of the best public accounts in the world. There is a parallel reform occurring in the education sphere with transparent reporting through national standards and literacy and numeracy. It's a simple philosophy. You can't manage what you don't measure. This Valuing Nature Conference needs to add momentum to our efforts to develop robust environmental reporting systems. Blue Green's second key step is moving to a more collaborative model of environment decision making. Our debates on nature have been stuck in our British judicial heritage of a polarised prosecution and defence that has actually inhibited us finding real solutions. A good example was five years ago with Fish and Game's Dirty Deering campaign and Federated Farmers simultaneously claiming environmentalists were committing economic treason for New Zealand. The progress that the Land and Water Forum has made through a collaborative process has been hugely encouraging. We've got environmentalists recognising we've got to earn a living in the world and farmers constructively engaged in improving water quality. It's the same sort of thinking that has DOC leading its partnership model. People mistakenly believe this is about growing DOC's revenue. The real gains are in recruiting new champions for conservation. Collaborative processes are also delivering real results for nature, with progress on marine protection on the west coast, sub-Antarctic islands and Kaikoura, with lake and river cleanups in places like Rotorua and on the Waikato, and on complex landscape and biodiversity protection in areas like the Mackenzie country. The third step the Blue Greens think is vital is smart use of economic tools to better value nature. My home constituency in Nelson is dominated by the fishing industry. Prior to the quota management system, my fishing constituents thought their most important asset was their fishing boat. And behold, anybody who stood in their way of them catching more fish. Under the quota management system, their most important asset today is their quota. And a negative resource report can wipe out their retirement nest egg. This has revolutionised their attitude to the resource, and this has flowed into a far better managed fishery. The waste levy we introduced in 2009 is another useful economic tool that promotes smarter resource use. The ETS introduced in 2010, albeit with a huge complexity in a global volatile market, was also a step in the right direction. 
the most innovative in this space is actually the nitrogen cap and trade model adopted to limit nutrients into our largest lake at Lake Taupo. The future will be in improving these economic tools and developing more to encourage business to better value and manage nature. My fourth and final ingredient is in the importance of science and technology. We should never underestimate the power of human innovation. I look at an issue like air pollution and marvel at how quickly and inexpensively particulate pollution has been removed from vehicle emissions over the past 20 years. In 2007, I had one of New Zealand's very first all-electric cars. I confess it was a bit of a dog. But my latest, the Mitsubishi Merv, is a zippy, beautiful car with a zero-carbon future. Last week, I met with New Zealand inventors of the New Zealand Spitfire Pest Eradicator that is able to reset and kill a hundred pests like stoats that is a game changer in our battle to save treasured species like our kiwi. My own department has developed new technology that halve the costs of being able to control wilding pines. We need to invest heavily in the clean technology of the future that will help us find that path forward that will enable us to enjoy better living standards with lesser environmental impacts. I look forward to hearing the deliberations from this Valuing Nature Conference. This is a unique opportunity to be part of a wider recognition of the role that natural capital will play in our future livelihoods, our health, security and prosperity of not just New Zealand but the wider world. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Minister. A couple of housekeeping uh, matters first. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, want to remind you, please, that there is no wireless in the theater. For so if any of you are seeking it, uh, it won't be there. Uh, and secondly, it's timely to remind you that uh, now's a good time to turn off all cell phones if uh, you haven't al already done so. In just a moment, I'll invite uh, Al Morrison, the Director General of the Department of Conservation, to chair the first session. Question time will follow our speaker. Uh, at which time we will invite those of you wishing to ask questions to come down to the two standing microphones, uh, which will be on the main aisle there. I think you can see one on each side, uh, and they are on, by the way. Uh, if you want to do that, there are some reserved seats, and you're welcome to sit in those while you wait to ask the questions. The chair will take questions alternately from each microphone. Uh, now I invite Al Morrison, the Director General of the, of the Department of Conservation, to chair our very first session today. Well, welcome to a typical calm, clear, crisp, sunny Wellington day. When you fly over New Zealand on such a day, uh, it's hard not to be distracted by the brown slick extending from any of our uh, river mouths uh, out to sea and up the coast. And a good proportion of that uh, silt is our topsoil. Our rivers carry more mud and silt load than almost any other countries. That is the base of our economy, leaving the land where our pastoral farmers and our foresters need it and moving down river to damage and destroy estuarine and inshore marine ecosystems and penalise others such as marine farmers and commercial fishers. Depending on the soil type, it takes between 100 and 500 years to build two to three centimetres of that topsoil. So in effect, it's a non-renewable resource. The planet's covered by, on average, uh, about one metre of it. We're losing it to sea and air at the rate of about 1% a year and accelerating. Do the maths. The story repeats in various forms for coral reefs, wetlands, tropical rainforests, we are degrading our ecosystems to a point that they cannot adequately supply the services we rely on. And yet still, we tend to focus on the ever-increasing costs of trying to fix the problems we have created rather than to deal to the causes. At the heart of this is an economic system that factors out our reliance on nature. It is a system that dismisses spending on environmental health as a discretionary nicety of the wealthy. 
The falsity of that thinking is being exposed by a growing demand for the services that we require from nature, outstripping nature's ability to supply them. The dire impacts of living in disharmony with nature are becoming all too evident. This requires a new way of thinking about the economy and the environment that is challenging governments, citizens and business. But the will to deny is strong. It takes authoritative, skilled and determined leadership to challenge economic orthodoxy. Pavan Sukhdev is providing that leadership. Pavan's CV, the positions he has held, the studies he's been involved in, his writings, the honours he's been awarded are well rehearsed and set out on the website to this conference. Intimidating though that exhaustive pedigree may be, it does not paint the whole picture. The whole is the strong and effective leadership role that Pavan has taken on the international stage. He has been instrumental in the intellectual reframing of how we must see the economy and the environment and in the practical application of that. He has played a pivotal role in making nature and its links to our prosperity a central part of a new economic paradigm. His leadership and advocacy is giving visibility to the value of nature and bringing natural capital into the centre of our reckoning and accounting. Pavan is a bridge builder, setting out a green economy growth path that with the resolve of all would restore a sustainable relationship between the health of nature and the well-being of humanity. We are privileged to have Pavan Sukhdev to speak at this conference and I ask you to welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Al, for those uh, kind and flattering remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a distinct pleasure and privilege to be here with you. Uh, I don't think I have been this far east, even though I come from India, which is an eastern land. And uh, certainly, even though I do visit Australia and Indonesia, I think this is my first New Zealand visit. So I'm doubly delighted to be here. Um, I was told that the Lord of the Rings was launched at this screen, so I have serious competition if I have to try and hold the attention of people. But I'd like to begin by saying that uh, the whole idea of valuing nature is something that's ancient and fundamental and global. And uh, I begin by reminding you of this picture of the Amazonas rainforest. It's better known as a store of carbon and as a deep forest and as a wonder house of biodiversity, but few people would think of this as a rainfall factory. And yet I have a small clip, a movie clip from the NOAA, the National uh, uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, which will remind you what this forest is doing. There are actually three regions in the world. The Amazonas rainforest there on the right. In the middle here is the Indonesian archipelago, this massive area of cloud. And further to the west, you can see Congo. And if you notice these white strands that are moving and the clock is moving, could you, could you reactivate that, please? Keep, keep the clock moving. Yeah. You can sort of see the, the colors uh, pulsating, uh, the kind of heart beating in these three rainforest regions. There's an orange white. The orange is when it's actually raining, the white is water vapor. And these are actually the rainfall factories because it's the evapotranspiration of these forests that is actually seeding a lot of the rainfall that we get around the world. When we talk about globalization, few people would think of the rainfall, the global rainfall cycle, but actually this globalization precedes anything that economics brought to the table. And yet this is fundamental to our agricultural economies. So here's an example of the rainforest in Brazil and what that in, in the Amazonas and what that does. The Amazonas rainforest basically takes the water vapor from the northeastern trade winds, adds to, its, adds to it with its own evapotranspiration, 20 billion tons per day, and that's really what seeds the rainfall cycle in the Amazonas. 
So the whole plain of the La Plata, the sort of granary of Latin America, is actually getting its rainfall from this cycle that you observe. The plains of Mato Grosso, as of uh, North Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, are actually receiving water, a fundamental source of the agricultural economy from this cycle, $240 billion. Of course, how much of that is attributable to the water supply is a tough question, and Teeb took the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, the project, took a stab at calculating that in the range of eight to $12 billion. The reality is it's not a number that you see in any national GDP, and it's not a number that you see in common parlance, but it's hugely economically important. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what the economic invisibility of nature is all about. Amazing value, huge amounts of value that's delivered to economies around the world, the fundamental, actually, and as you in New Zealand know well, and yet we don't recognize it. We don't demonstrate its value. We don't capture that value, and that is one of the key challenges of our times, is how do we recognize, demonstrate, and capture some of the value that nature brings to the economy and to society in a way that's positive and policy relevant and business relevant. The project team on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, which I was privileged to lead, uh, was first started off in 2008 with a simple uh, challenge, which is find out what is the cost of policy in action? The fact that we do not have policies around the world which are supportive of nature conservation, supportive of natural capital as an asset. What's the cost of inaction? And one of the exercises that we commissioned was exactly that, the cost of policy in action. So we projected the losses of biodiversity. Biodiversity as an ecosystem, species, genetic material, biodiversity as both the variability as well as the quantity of natural capital. And through our various projections and calculations, it was found that those losses were quite significant and that if they continued, we would be effectively have damaged national, global uh, incomes, GDP, as measured in GDP, by almost 7% by the year 2050. Now, you can present that in a different way. So if you see there's a sort of declining uh, line out there, the dark green line, and that's the sort of projection of uh, natural capital loss. Another way of looking at that is to say that that triangle of loss can be broken up year by year into what was the cost of policy in action this year, and that means adding up all the lost services of nature for the next 40 years and discounting them, in other words, getting their present value. And that's basically natural capital. It's the present value of the future incomes that you potentially have lost as well as a result of losing nature. Losses of natural capital, we estimated, were of the order of one to three trillion euros. In other words, two to four and a half trillion US dollars per annum. That's significant. If you compare losses of that kind, you need to go back to 2008 and the financial crisis. That was the kind of money that was lost in that crisis as a, and was actually financed through uh, bailouts and, and through uh, issuance of more money by the central banks. So that's the kind of size in economic terms that we are talking about. And yet, once again, because of the economic invisibility of nature, even though every newspaper in every country would every day for, for many months have carried stories of the crisis in 2008, hardly any actually brought up this issue until, in fact, October, uh, when I believe it was the observer in the UK which first broke this idea that natural capital losses are also equally big. The project TEAB, I'll spend a few moments describing it because it's not, there's no reason why you should have heard of it, but it was started by the G8 plus five. It was hosted by the European Commission in Germany. It was begun, as I mentioned, in 2008. And its goal was to not just look at the size of the costs of these losses of nature in economic terms, but to try and suggest solutions and our design for this was to look at solutions not just in the area of policy, but also in the area of practical administration in terms of what does a mayor do about this? What does a local district or a state or a province do about this? Indeed, what do people do about this problem? And not just policymakers. And therefore, we had to write in a different language, if you like, for different audiences. There was no point just writing one big study, uh, such as you know, uh, the cost of climate change. 
such as the Stern Review, but we had to write in a language which was relevant for policymakers at the international and national levels, and other for the administrators and mayors, and other yet for people at large, which was not a study, it was a website. And this generated the so-called TEAB series of reports. They were launched in 2010 in uh, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a big UN conference in Japan in Nagoya. Our project had uh, uh, many strengths, and amongst the key, I would say, was a, a very, very uh, serious and senior advisory board. And uh, this included uh, personalities such as uh, Lord Stern, who was the, the lead author of the Stern Review on Climate Change, uh, Akim Steiner, the head of the United Nations Environment Program, uh, Yolanda Kakabadze, who's the Ecuadorian Environment Minister and then the president of the World uh, WWF, uh, Julia Martin de Ferre, who's the head of IUCN, um, Ed Barbier, who's one of the leading academicians in this, in this sphere, Kallior Mailer, equally, and so on. So quite, a, quite an amazing collection of senior people were committed to this project, and I think that was part of its trend, the bonding and the reach that we got was thanks to our advisory board. And quite early on, even though the reports were written and hosted by different institutions, such as a university, a European uh, Environmental Policy Institute, the IUCN itself, and uh, two institutes, one from India and one from Germany, these institutions collectively began to be part of a partnership, and that partnership grew wider with time. It was a partnership of the authors of the team, the institutions to which they belong, the supporters, the funders, various others joined. And as we went along, we got more funding and we got more recognition by the UN. Uh, we even had uh, a role in the Rio conventions in the Ecosystems Pavilion. We teamed up with Pricewaterhouse and Truecost and others to work on the business side. We had increasing funding from different uh, providers. The business side itself developed into another landscape of partnerships the box on the right-hand side, which you see, is basically just the companies from Brazil who were working on a TEAB study for Brazil specifically. And indeed, there are now almost 20-odd studies around the world which are trying to look at how to measure the value that ecosystems deliver to economies as a way of better framing policy solutions and better informing business decision-making. So that's what TEAB is, and this is what TEAB is not. So this is a little cartoon which I love because this is something that I keep coming across when I speak with, uh, with people, journalists, and, and those who are new to the topic. They think that valuing nature is about putting a price tag on everything. Here's a butterfly, what's its price? You know, here's a cloud, what's its price? And obviously, you can't do that. You can't price a butterfly. You can't price a cloud. You can't even price the services of any particular cloud. No one can tell the clouds where to rain. No one can tell the bees which field to pollinate. But what we do know is that the cost of not having the rainfall cycle is huge, and we know what it's worth to the economy of, of Brazil. We do know that the cost of pollination, if we lose the pollinators, is huge, and it's estimated of the order of $200 billion per annum. And we can work that out based on what was the amount of output, fruit output in good bee years and bad bee years, and in the US alone, for example, that's between seven and $15 billion per annum. So we can actually work out the absence of pollinators and how much that costs in terms of fruit output to a particular economy, and likewise to the rest of the world. So there are ways of estimating what nature delivers, but there isn't a way of pricing nature. You can value nature, you don't have to price nature. That's the first thing that I'll, I'll have to say here, is that there is a huge difference. Price is what you pay. Value is what you receive. We receive a huge amount of value from nature every day. We wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, but we don't need to price nature, and I think that's part of the, the challenge of communicating what this is all about. It's not about converting everything to a dollar sign. It's not about putting a little tag saying this butterfly or that cloud is worth so and so. And this is how TEAB actually looks at valuation. We think firstly of valuation as valuing ecosystem services. In other words, valuing what nature delivers to the economy and to society. And we do that by first looking at where can we recognize value. Valuation is a human institution. It's as much an institution as taxation or as, 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 uh, uh, as law or, or as uh, social order and, and 
and so on. And we have certain kinds of ecosystem services, such as inspiration, design inspiration from nature, which is that little paintbrush on the left-hand side, or genetic uh, fundamentals provided, that little sign on the right-hand side, or habitat for wild species. Now, would you go and check with the owl how much his home is worth? That doesn't work. So neither can you figure out what's the absence of genetic material going to be. It's going to be worth everything, and so on. So there are certain things which just do not lend themselves easily to demonstrating or to, to measuring in, in any quantitative sense. Some can be quantified, but they can't, measure, they can't be measured in money. But you can certainly recognize that they are valuable. You can see that as a human being. That's what I mean about uh, the institution, the human institution evaluations. Uh, in my country, in India, there are more than 5,000 communities who value forests as sacred to them. And they would give their lives for those forests because they believe their deity or their, their ancestor spirits live there. That's valuation. You didn't have to teach them economics to do that. The second kind of valuation is what we call demonstrating value, where you can actually convert what value is delivered into a dollar sign, into a, a quantum. And that applies, as I mentioned, to pollination, that little logo on the left-hand side. It applies to soil erosion. Uh, Minister Smith, um, sorry, Al mentioned this a moment ago in terms of silt losses. Well, one of the ways of preventing silt losses, one of the ways of preventing soil erosion is to have adequate land cover, adequate vegetation. And that's one of the functions that forests provide, which is prevention of soil erosion. That's that little logo on the right-hand side with the tree. You can value that because you know the cost of replacing the soil fertility that is lost as a result of erosion. Likewise, you can measure the impacts of storms and cyclones, um, and you can see whether, for instance, a mangrove forest provides some protection against that. So that's another way of valuing the protection service of the environment. So that's examples of demonstrating value. And then finally, in some instances, you can capture value, and you can especially where there is a market equivalency, for instance, drugs, pharmaceuticals, carbon markets out there, that fish symbol and wheat uh, uh, stock is basically food, materials, fresh water. It is possible to reward the conservation of, of uh, natural areas, the conservation of areas which provide materials or food or fuel or fiber or water. It's possible to reward the stewardship, the good stewardship of that kind of natural area with some economic value as a way of ensuring that that ecosystem service is continued into the future. So some things can be just understood, recognized, but not in sometimes even measured. Some, some things can be measured and valued, and yet others you can measure value and even exchange money for them in order to conserve. And all of this is actually part of the wider institution of valuation. The methods of valuation are a huge science, and I'm trying to summarize here a basically a framework that we in the, the TEAB group have adopted, the Total Economic Value Framework, where, again, you can see that on the right-hand side are what we call non-use values, values which do not have any particular use to society or to the economy, such as the existence value, that the fundamental intrinsic value of something. Uh, there are other values which are such as philanthropic values where you feel that you need to bequeath what you see to future generations. Again, quite difficult to value. Or the altruistic value where you feel that others, as in not just you and your society, but poorer societies should benefit from nature and that you should do something towards that. These are all aspects of value, but not easy in any sense to quantify. Then there are those which you can, because you use them and because they have economic implications, you can quantify. And some are used directly and some are used indirectly, such as soil erosion prevention and, and soil fertility and fresh water and so on. So there's a whole landscape of values, uh, all of which are valuable, but not all of which can be quantified and not all of those quantified can actually be monetized. And I think that's important to understand because this is how we go about creating a framework for valuation. And the methods, so this is just the framework, the methodologies are even more diverse. And, and, and this is just a snapshot of some of the, the key ones that have been used. You can use direct market-based valuation approaches. Um, if you're losing soil fertility, then that means potentially the cost of fertilizers to replace nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And you know what the cost is, so that's a cost-based approach. Sometimes preferences can be revealed. For instance, if you have, for the sake of argument, a house 
close to a city but overlooking a natural park, that might command some premium. If you have, for instance, as I do in New York, a flat two streets away from Central Park, it's actually worth half as much as a flat directly overlooking Central Park um, for no reason except that people like to enjoy the view of nature from there. And that million dollar difference is basically the value of that view. Everything else is the same. It's, it's the same street, it's the same location. And that's what we call uh, hedonic pricing, basically working out what people pay differentially, knowing the reason why they pay it, but not necessarily having a price for that reason. And then finally, there are these, what we call stated preference approaches, which, for example, uh, you can go about doing surveys of what citizens are willing to pay the government for an additional amount of money for the sake of argument, conserving a national park or changing a tax law or whatever. So there are all of these types of valuations. So the whole area is quite complex. It's quite well researched and there's a huge amount of literature. I think the challenge that the T group faced was how do we bring this theoretical knowledge into the hands of decision makers? Decision makers who are in government, ministers, policy makers, decision makers in local governments, decision makers in companies, and finally, consumers and citizens also as decision makers. That was really the challenge that we addressed. And to remind you, if we look at that challenge and break it up into the challenge of recognition of value, demonstration of value, and capturing of value, you can imagine these three, just bear in your minds these three words, the rec value recognition, value demonstration, and value capture. And what we did was figuratively uh, in, this, in this diagram represented as three concentric um, ellipses. Recognizing value as the broadest. You recognize value in, in the most fundamental human way without much external assistance, in economics even. You can demonstrate value using economic logic, valuation frameworks, valuation methodologies. And sometimes you can capture value, which means having established the economic value, set up systems, mechanisms, policies, which will reward a group that conserves that value and charge a group that benefits from that value. And there are basically five types of implementation strategies, I should call them, basically five strategies that we describe in the many TIB reports. And by the way, when I talk about strategies, these are generic strategies. So if, we, if you log into the TIB website, www.tibweb.org, you will actually find more than 100 examples and of, of these covering all of these different types. But the kinds of examples are, you can change regional plans based on your understanding of ecosystem services. That's one uh, strategy. You can change legislations, laws, uh, conservation laws. You can create certifications, whether they are eco-certifications or eco-labels, in order to reward better, cons better conservation practice. You can value protected areas and then change policy and budgeting towards those protected areas. Value the ecosystem services that come from protected areas to society. And finally, you can set up PES, payments for ecosystem services, which is a way of compensating, for the sake of argument, uh, upstream farmers for changing their practices, such as was done in so many places, all the way from the Catskills in New York, where the water supply is clean because the farmers have leased their land across to the, the municipality, to the north of Beijing, where the farmers have changed their agricultural practices in order that the water supply is cleaner and costs less to the Beijing municipality. So those are examples of payments for ecosystem services. They're negotiated payments. It's not a market, and they're not hundreds of people buying and selling water between the Catskills and so on. It's basically from one municipality to another. So it's usually two government departments who are setting up a payment for ecosystem service. So when people say, oh God, you're, mo you're monetizing nature, you're converting everything into a saleable good, I just shrug my shoulders and say, have you ever seen a market? There are two government officers sitting across the table negotiating what one pays to the other. That's not really a market, but they're using market logic. They're using economic logic to express what is a fair value for one to pay to the other. So these strategies can also, the same strategies, the five strategies, can be broken up into broadly three categories. And they are norms and regulations and policies, which is where we get regional plans and legislations. Then there are what I call economic mechanisms, not really markets as such, certification, protected area valuations, payments for ecosystem services. And then finally, markets. And there are basically in the T reports of the 100 plus examples, there are three examples. There's the um, uh, US wetland banking market, which is basically compensating uh, 
by uh, the, the destruction of wetlands in one place by setting up wetlands in another and buying and selling that capacity and the biodiversity markets in Australia. And that's about it. So we have actually a very small role for markets per se in this whole space of valuing biodiversity. And that's the point I was making up front, which is it's about valuation, it's not about pricing. Prices are what you pay. Sometimes you just don't pay anything. In fact, most of the time you don't pay anything because nature provides its services for free. We use nature because she's valuable. We lose nature because she's free. And that's actually the fundamental challenge. How do we stop that? So I give you my, just to illustrate the point a bit better, I give you my favorite examples. So I, I mentioned that one of the five strategies was about planning, regional planning. So here's my favorite example of regional plans, and it's from China. This is the zoning plan for the Baoxing County in, in Sichuan province. When they went about their initial planning, they hadn't accounted for ecosystem services. But thanks to a software known as Invest, they were able to use that software and actually create a map of the county which showed where was the high intensity and the relatively low intensity areas. And then they actually used that knowledge of where is the valuable uh, ecosystem service generation coming from to change their regional plans in 2010. And I think that was a really powerful example. Once again, there wasn't a uh, monetization or a calculation of the economic value of those ecosystem services, but through this software, uh, there was certainly a recognition, and therefore I put this under the value recognition uh, side of valuation. An example of legislation, the strategy of legislation, uh, my favorite is from the Philippines, where shortly after the bleaching event in 1998, uh, a group got together, the national government, the local government, local fishermen, uh, some NGOs, international NGOs as well, and basically recognized that in order to let the reef regenerate for everyone's benefit, they would need to have a no-go area. And that no-go area was, in fact, set up first and then increased over time uh, from into a 10-mile buffer zone, which basically has been measured to increase the stock of uh, fish in that area, and also it has enabled the coral reefs to recover. The, the restriction of access to that. As a result of that, there's generally an increase in fish biomass, but there's also an in, a gradual increase in coral cover that's been noticed out here. And I think this is something that uh, uh, Minister Smith also referred to when he talked about fishing quotas, as in control fishing as actually an asset, as against just going in and mining the fish, so to speak. An example of valuing protected areas comes from, my favorite is, is from uh, Uganda, this is a picture of a swamp out there, the Nakibubo Swamp, which is not far from the center of Kampala, their capital city. Initial plans were to, in fact, drain the swamp and convert it into more land for uh, habitation and agriculture, until an economist presented the value of that swamp as basically a, a sewage treatment plant, a natural sewage treatment plant. And that value was eight or 10 times higher than the net value of having drained the swamp and constructed it into habitation and agricultural space. And you would also, as a result of drainage of the swamp, have lost the local fishing capacity and also lost the benefits to local communities. So uh, the government actually decided not to go ahead with this plan. And that's, that park is now part of the green belt. And finally, uh, an, a neat example of both payments for ecosystem services, as well as the role of certification comes from Japan. Uh, this was, um, inter interestingly enough, this was a TEEB example. It was in the TEEB reports, and I was actually asked to visit the city of Toyooka, which is referred to here. So I can vouch for the fact that these stalks actually have come back. What happened in this city was the residents were so fond of the stalk, and the Japanese are fond of the stalk, uh, that they uh, decided to change their agricultural practices and set up some areas of organic farming where the, uh, the insects and, and frogs and other species uh, are allowed to come back because of organic farming and more use of water. So it's not necessarily environmentally good in the broadest sense because more water is being used, but it certainly reintroduces the feeding species for the white stalk. Uh, they introduced some captured white stalks from Russia in, in uh, um, into this area, and gradually, and when I was there in 2010, they had gone up to something from just a few pairs of stalks to about 40 pairs of stalks. 
And at the same time, they put up uh, an ecotourism center around this whole experiment of converting the agricultural practice and allowing the stocks to come back and so on. And that little center earns uh, something like uh, uh, $10 million per annum on, at current rates of exchange. Now, the way this works is that they first have to provide some incentives for the farmers to start organic farming, so they did that, and they gradually reduced the incentive because the certification of, that, of the rice that grows there actually gives a premium to the rice. So the white stalk rice sells at 25 to 50% higher than normal rice. And as a result of that, they were able to pull back the subsidies. So it's not subsidized anymore, but it was certainly useful to have the payments for ecosystem service, the subsidy introduced initially. And now we have an amazing situation where it's a self-sustaining scheme. There are something like 230 plus hectares of land under this so-called hobby farming type of organic farming. And uh, they have hopefully now more than 40 breeding pairs of it when I was there. And on top of that, they've also increased their uh, municipal income thanks to the Ecotourism Museum, uh, increased it by 1.4%, which may not sound like a lot, but I can tell you in Japan, 1.4% is huge. You know, it's a zero growth economy with zero interest rates. I come to my uh, example of fisheries, uh, because this is another place where I think Teeb weighed in in terms of the value of stock versus the value of mining the stock. Um, firstly, why are fisheries important? It's, it's not merely um, a business. It's not merely that we are losing productivity of the order of an estimated $50 billion per annum. That's a, a World Bank and FAO statistic. Uh, we are because of the general problem of pelagic fishing in the open waters and because the regional fisheries management organizations aren't as effective as we'd like them to be, and because there is still an open access regime in ocean fish, we are losing fishery stock. Various estimates, I, mean, I don't need to go over them, but 20 to 40% are either depleted completely or soon to be depleted, and the problems are fairly serious. So what's at risk here? Firstly, you have the risk of the sector itself, pelagic fisheries, that's about 85 or $100 billion of economic value that could be at risk. Then, to me more importantly, there's something like an estimated 35 million jobs, not just directly in fisheries, of course, but in all the ancillaries, in all of the storage and processing and so on. And most importantly to me, what's at risk is health, because fish provide the main source of animal protein to more than a billion people in the developing world. And if we don't have adequate supplies of fish, then you lose that. And the reason this is a real risk is because as pelagic fisheries increase, as people invest more money in bigger fleets to fish further and fish deeper, what actually happens is that the artisanal coastal fisher folk can't get the same supply. So in fact, the poor who are dependent on those same stocks at, uh, at areas, in, in sometimes in the same areas, simply are not able to fish as much as they used to. Um, I still remember the words of a gentleman from Africa sharing a panel, he says, looked at me thinking I was a Spaniard for some reason and responsible for the problem. He says, you Europeans, when you fish in our waters, my canoes come home empty. And these are five words which I will not forget to my dying day because that really, to me, summarized the problem. So in, in numbers, what does this mean? Sorry about this large number of graphs so early in the morning, but Here's, here's the two lines that I want you to focus on, the one in green and the one in red. The one in green is that the one with the squares going up and up and up. That's basically the size of the vessel capacity, the, the capacity to catch fish, the size of the vessels. And the red line is actually the catch per unit capacity. So what's happening here? We are investing more and more in increasing the size of, of uh, fishing fleets and increasing their capacity, fishing capacity, but at the same time, we are decreasing at the same time because of depletion of fish stocks, the amount of fish per unit capacity. Net result, nothing. Basically, 26, 20, sorry, $27 billion of subsidies globally for fisheries, out of which a friend of mine once classified them as good, bad, and ugly. He said about 19 out of the 20, 27 billion, according to his calculations, were bad or ugly subsidies, which means they either worsen the stock of fish or you just can't tell what they do. So that's the, that's the situation we have. We are subsidizing these global fisheries around the world, uh, actually worsening the problem in economic terms and in social terms. Now, one of the, the areas of contention which, which I want to 
weigh in on is that there is a strong argument that using protected areas, using no-go zones, using no-go areas, using better fisheries management, basically, is a way of restoring fish stock. And I'm not uh, a biologist, but biologists tell me that the reason this works is that if you allow fish to grow bigger, basically female fish, if they grow to twice the size, they can produce 10 to 100 times as many eggs, depending on which species and what location and region. And it's really therefore about allowing the female fish to grow bigger in order that they can lay more and restore uh, fish productivity. And if we do that, the results can be quite, quite impressive. Now, of course, this is hotly disputed by many uh, fisheries lobbies, uh, I'm, I'm sure even in New Zealand. But here's an example from the US area. Here is where a satellite imaging really helps in getting clarity. And this map shows the, in the dots basically the vessel hours. So the, the blue dots are basically one to eight vessel hours, uh, green dots next, and then so on and so forth. And the red dots are the heaviest amount of fishing, the number of vessel hours in that particular location. Uh, some of you may recognize from the geography that that is Cape Cod on the left-hand side. There's a thing down on the left-hand side there. I'm going to look at the blue areas, which is basically the no-go zones that they've put into George's Bank off the U.S. coast. And these no-go areas, uh, you can see that they are clear of dots, apart from a few random ones, I guess, you know, you, by mistake you might be fishing inside or whatever. But apart from the, the few by mistake kind of situations, most of the dots are clear, or most of the areas are clear. And I want to focus for a second on the, the little inverted triangle in the middle, um, right in the middle out there. Sorry, this thing's the one at the bottom in the middle. And I'm going to give you an enlargement of that triangle. So let's see what's actually happening here. So that's that same triangle, enlarged. Now you can see where the fishing is taking place, all at the edges of the protected area. Why? Because nobody told the fish where the protected area is. So obviously, fish stocks grow, they increase in size, they float outside. The most logical place for any fisherman to be is at the edge of the protected area. So by their own actions, they are demonstrating that this strategy of conservation is a success. I rest my case. Now, one of the other areas of policy that is affected by, fish, by, by, by uh, valuation um, and is involved with valuation is the policy of how do you reflect value at the national level, the accounts of society, national accounting. How do you work out what to measure? Because as has been said by all of you this morning is that you cannot manage what you do not measure and at the same time, what you do measure, you tend to manage. So here's the... Um, Here's the approach that is being followed right now as an alternative, and it's an approach called inclusive wealth. Uh, this is also on the, is the base for what is known as WAVES, the World Bank's project called WAVES, Wealth Accounting and Valuation for Ecosystem Services. The logic, the thinking here is, is uh, the work of uh, a few uh, economists. Leading amongst those is Partha Dasgupta and Karl Jörn Mailer. Mailer is one of our advisory board members and uh, Kenneth Arrow, who is also a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, das Pukopta is, is again someone who's been very supportive of, of this project, of the TEAB project. And of course, Carl Jörn Mailer is, is an advisory board member. So the, their logic is very straightforward. What they're saying is that we tend to measure only what is manufactured. We tend to measure man-made capital, in other words. So if it's a factory, if it's a road, if it's a bridge, we do value it. And that gets picked up in GDP accounts. But they're saying we do not measure and therefore do not manage aspects of capital which are important. Human capital, as in knowledge and good health, absolutely vital. How would you manage without good health and, and intellect and skills? Social capital, as in relationships and law and order and communal harmony and so on. How would you manage to conduct business in a society which didn't have these? So these are aspects of capital which enable, support, and drive business and income, but they are not measured. So they're saying, let's start doing that. Let's start measuring these other aspects of capital, especially natural capital, because it is so important. And then let us look at total wealth, inclusive wealth, as in let's look at the total amount of capital available to the citizens of a country, add it up, divide by the population, and if that average increases, then we have genuine increase in wealth. Then we have what we call inclusive wealth growing. 
So this is not a theory, it's, it's been tested out and the statistics of the World Bank have been used by these authors in order to be able to uh, present uh, answers to us. So again, the valuation of these natural capital and human capital components is complex. It uses valuation methodologies, but it can be done. And here's an example of what has been done already uh, by these authors using World Bank statistics. Apologies to the people in, in the last few rows. If you can't read the numbers, shout. I, I, I'm going to read them out anyway. And the ones that I want you to focus on are the ones in the red. Now, what we have here is for several countries, um, and for a couple of regions like the Middle East and North Africa, a calculation firstly from the national accounts, the current system of national accounts, SE, SEEA, uh, of the domestic net investment, the net increase in savings per annum. And then against that, we've got expenditure on education, which is actually creating human capital, so we shouldn't be counting it as expenditure. And then they have a whole range of natural resource depletion calculations in terms of damage from emissions, uh, loss of energy, loss of minerals, loss of forests. Let's look at the Middle East and North Africa where if you look at domestic net investment from the official accounts, the system of national accounts, that's 14.7%. But if you look at the adjusted account, it shows minus 7.09%. And the reason for that, of course, is that because you are drilling oil, you're actually depleting an asset. So when you're measuring your net savings, you should subtract from that the loss of the oil, that is the undersea asset or the underground asset that you're depleting. It's an asset. It should be recognized as any business should recognize assets. The country should recognize the asset. And when it removes it from the ground, it should, dip, it should subtract it. In other words, depreciation of the asset. And that depreciation, ladies and gentlemen, is huge and tells us what's happening in the Middle East. That's not real progress. They're actually simply mining and selling an asset. So, as you can see from, from there, the big number out there, which converts the plus 14.7 into a minus 7, is actually the 25% of GDP that is under the column called energy depletion, which is basically loss of the oil. Take another example from Nepal, uh, where you begin with a domestic net investment, which is reasonably healthy. Now, just to give you an idea, China is about 30% net savings, net domestic investment. Everyone knows that they're a high end of that scale. And there are other countries like the UK and the US, which are at the low end, it's just three to five, three to five percent. So 14 percent for Nepal, a small country to the north of India, is actually not bad. And it shows that the government is got some good policies in place and it is investing. But despite their efforts in education, which are quite significant, 2.65 percent of GDP as, as uh, education expenditure, they still actually end up with a final genuine investment of only 13 percent. And the reason for that is that they have huge forest depletion taking place. So they are losing 3.6% of GDP per year in terms of net forest losses. Now the question to ask is, well, what if they increase their educational expenditure and other forms of social investment and actually compensated for the 3.6% of forest losses? Is that good enough? Is that a good thing? And there are different views. My own view is that you have to ask whose growth and what growth, right? It's easy to say that growth is good. What's difficult is to find out what growth, growth in what, in other words, and growth for whom. And here's where we have to look at, when we look at growth, is it growth of capital that we are talking about, which in my opinion is a good thing, or is it growth of use, of utilization, of consumption, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on what it results in. So we have to look at who's, what capital is growing and for whom is it growing? For whom is that capital delivering income? And this is the key to answering the question that I just asked, which is, if you were to increase education 3.67% of GDP, uh, or have that expenditure there, and then lose forests, is that good enough? And then the question is, to whom do the benefits of those forests flow? And this leads me to the point about looking at natural capital in developing countries, where what we found in the TEAP project is that if we just measured these are three countries that we use, Indonesia, India, and, and Brazil. If we just measured ecosystem services as economic invisibles, which were not there, and said, okay, what, as, to give a sense of size, what percentage are they as a percentage of national GDPs? Well, the answer is not, not terribly impressive, 10%, 16%, 20%. So yes, it's a problem that we are not measuring these and not capturing these, but it's not a huge problem. 
But the question to ask is, again, whose GDP? Who benefits from the forest? Who loses when the forest is lost? Well, it's the poor farmer who can't get fuel wood from the forest for, for cooking, and, or for that matter, leaf litter for his cows, or nutrients and fresh water that flow from the forest to the field, and therefore he has to spend more on fertilizers. So if it is a poor farmer who is losing, then we should be not just looking at, at just national GDP, we should be looking at the GDP of the poor, of the, of the rural poor in these developing countries. And this is when it gets interesting, because when we find how many such people are dependent on nature for their survival, whether it's 100 million in Indonesia or 20 million uh, gatherers in the northern rainforest in Brazil, or 350 million, of which there are 270 million small farmers, subsistence farmers, and 70 million tribals living in or near forests. Those are the people for whom ecosystem services really matter, because they are not 10, 15, 20% of their household income, they're actually more like 47%, 75%, 89% on average of their household incomes. So the question to ask is not are ecosystem services large as a percentage of GDP, but what are ecosystem services as a percentage of the GDP of the poor? And that, unless we ask and answer that question, and clearly it can be done because we've got examples, I think we are missing the point here because you cannot assume substitutability and you cannot assume substitutability of educational and health and, in other words, human capital with natural capital or that with manufactured capital because those capitals are providing incomes to different people and you can't just wish away or assume away the existence of the poor for whom nature provides most of their incomes. Now, the T project at a country level is, is making good progress, not as fast as I want, as Georgina has always witness to the fact that nothing is ever fast enough, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, but we have about 20 odd countries where it started, and uh, of late, China has also committed itself to do the TEED project, which is excellent, because that's one country where they've really understood in practical terms that there's a cost, because they've uh, blundered into, in my opinion, blundered into the cost scenario of losing nature, and now they are trying their best to recover some of nature. The world's largest reforestation project is in, in, uh, in China, in the lowest plateau in North China. Up there. And uh, you, you will see from this variety of logos that everyone takes the TEAB logo and converts it to whatever they like. And uh, I guess there's not much we can do about it, right, Georgina? So basically, this is it's their project. It's everyone's project. It's not, it's not uh, our project. And the good news is that I think, broadly speaking, there is enough guidance, and broadly speaking, people are using the guidance to move in, in the right direction. So that's on the government side. But now, let me spend the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes that I have and talk about the business side. Today's economy, today's economy is largely a private sector economy. Two-thirds of GDP, 70% of jobs are private sector. So if we think we can just by changing policies make a huge change in society and, and how it operates and how the economy operates, that's not gonna happen. We have to change how the corporation works and how that operates. And I think that brings us to the whole area of tea for business. And I illustrated with a simple example of business externalities with a shrimp farming business in, in Thailand. If you convert a mangrove swamp to a shrimp farm, you might believe that you're make, making a profitable choice and a good trade-off because the shrimp farm generates over its life of, of six, seven years uh, a $9,600 profit, whereas just harvesting fuel wood from the mangroves would only be worth about $600. But unfortunately, that's not a good story because part of the $9,600 is just subsidy, government subsidy for the shrimp farm. So you have to subtract that out. So then the comparison is not so, not so dramatic. But the real comparison is after you've accounted for the public costs and the public benefits. Because if you account for the public benefits of mangroves, the storm protection, and these have been measured and valued, when you find that the, the housing and the, the, the property of villagers in the coastline is much better defended when there is a mangrove forest, the value of that storm protection is $10,000. And conversely, when you figure out and realize that when you have mangrove swamps converted to shrimp farms, salt deposition and chemical deposition as a result of the shrimp farming basically destroys that land and makes it unusable for anything within, within a short period, within six, seven years. And the cost of that is almost on average $9,000. So it's not a question of plus 9,000 versus 600, it's actually minus 9,000 versus plus 12,000. 
So depending on which lens you use to measure your trade-off choice, lens of private profits on the left-hand side, or the lens of public wealth on the right-hand side, you come to a completely opposite answer. It was right to convert, it was completely idiotic to convert. And that's, that's the whole challenge. So we need to look at externalities, and this whole challenge has been looked at, and of course, as you can see, the reason for the externality is that we haven't accounted for natural capital. Again, the same old problem, economic invisibility of nature and its services. And this exercise has been done now for the top 3,000 companies and more by a group called True Cost, and they've actually worked out that the total cost, the externalities in terms of carbon emissions, fresh water, loss of environmental quality, uh, lo loss of, uh, of air pollution and, and uh, general waste impacts on health and so on, all of the impacts of corporations collectively for the top 3,000 companies is about $2 trillion, which is about 3.5% of global GDP, and that's huge. That is absolutely huge. And what is more worrying, not just the size, is what kind of impacts. Impacts on natural resources, impacts on fresh water, impacts on greenhouse gases and, and climate effects. And if we look at the whole problem of planetary boundaries, Al, you mentioned some of the challenges being many dimensions of challenge. It's not just about climate change, it's also nitrogen, it's also phosphorus, it's also fresh water, it's also coral reefs, it's also ocean acidification, and, and so on. We are heading towards these planetary boundaries at a pace which is extremely worrying. Some would argue, as the Stockholm Resilience Center has done, that we have actually crossed planetary boundaries in biodiversity loss and climate change and nitrogen. Others would say that you're nearly there. But the point is, whether we've crossed or there, we, it's, it's bad, it's close, and it's dangerous. And the same, if you see in my, uh, I've circled the exact same drivers, greenhouse gases, water extraction, natural resource depletion, which are actually fundamental to the way that we are handling this economy. The externalities of business are basically the same as that are driving us towards these planetary boundaries in natural resources, in greenhouse gases, and in water extraction. Even with greenhouse gases, people forget that it's not just about climate change effects and so on, it's also about ocean acidification and the loss of ocean supply chains and the loss of coral reefs. So there are these undiscussed aspects of these, of these problems. So we have to fix this, there's no question. This has to be the biggest challenge of our times. How do we adjust the economic model so that the private sector can operate as if it were creating a green economy and not the exact opposite. Um, my book, I won't go into this, but it's, basically this is a one page summary of my book, so you don't actually need to read it, take a copy of this. You can just take a copy of this printout and you've got it. But I'll just mention the last part. I, I look at macroeconomic problems that are driving us. I look at the microeconomic, as in the corporate level drivers of those problems, that's the middle column, and then I look at the solutions. Uh, I think the reason why I did this analysis is that people were not able, not understanding sufficiently the extent to which the private sector is driving economic direction. Economic direction and resource use are driven three-fourths to two-thirds by the private sector. So that's the bad news. The good news is that there are solutions. And of the solutions, it's measuring and disclosing externalities that is the key solution when it comes to the private sector. And we do it wrong. Because we don't measure true performance, we don't incentivize the right behavior. If you start measuring the wrong thing, the answer is going to be wrong because that's what you did. Uh, again, good news is that one company at least and a few others, there are at least about 10 who are working on this right now. So one has already published this. That's Puma, that's Jochen Zeitz, who's the then chairman, executive chairman. They've gone ahead and published their entire externalities in enormous excruciating detail, literally down to which products, which elements of their supply chain, whether it's raw materials or whoever, and down to which area they are. So they have found that their total externalities, their costs of doing business as usual, are almost as big as their profits, and of course that's one good reason why they should stop doing that. And they've started negotiating with their suppliers to change their overall impacts. Uh, they're actually taking one stage to the consumer by putting down on their price tags, this is new, so it hasn't happened yet, but this is their plan, putting down on their price tags how much the true cost of a product is versus its actual, actual price. So this is a, a, a picture of a price tag which shows the environmentally friendly shirt versus the not so environmentally friendly shirt. And all of such initiatives will be taken up by a group called the Teep for Business Coalition. And that coalition is huge because it includes all the familiar names. Uh, I'm delighted that James is here. 
and uh, the World Business Council and Peter Backer, the, the president of the council, are actually leading lights within the coalition to move forward this massive global network which is trying to pull together the quantifications of these externalities, work on the valuation, and then be able to report the values in the same published accounts of companies that we are used to seeing. So there's no point putting these things into the CSR reports you know, and publish them on Christmas Eve and then comes uh, February or, or April and you publish the real accounts, publish it in the same place as we do other externalities and other, other disclosures. So the whole idea is to disclose in the national accounts. And some of these calculations are quite significant when we look at uh, national level, especially we look at coal-fired power and, and uh, we look at um, even something like cattle ranching in Latin America. $450 billion from one particular sector, coal-fired power, which is actually a bigger cost to society than the value it generates. And cattle ranching, $350 billion of cost as against generating an income of only about $16 billion, so 18 times worse. So these are the sort of uh, stupidities in our economic model that we really have to come out, talk about, address, and hopefully solve. It can be done. Many companies, including my own, have got approaches to doing it, and I think that's the good news. Problems are there. Yes, we have an issue with them. And yes, there are solutions. Let's work on them. Thank you very much. Um, Previn, thank you uh, for, um, I think, demonstrating it actually isn't complicated. Uh, I think uh, what you've shown <clears throat> is that the answers are there. The question is whether the will to apply them is. Uh, I have to apologise. I'm asked to keep to time. We don't have time for questions. That's the bad news. The good news is um, that this afternoon at the workshop there will be plenty of time um, to exchange. So if I could just ask, tell us to come and ask you once again, uh, we have a small Tonga, a small special gift for you to thank you and please put your hands together and thank Pavan. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, a, a few brief announcements before morning tea which is upon us. Uh, you will have noticed that we've got a, a capacity crowd today, so we ask for your support and consideration at um, uh, tea time and lunch time. Uh, please move promptly to get your drinks and then move aside for others. Uh, please use both entrances, that side and that side, into and out of the theater. And remember that you're welcome to get your drinks and food and bring them back in here uh, and have them in here. Uh, I've been asked by Glenda to make a special announcement regarding the loos. You'll be aware there the gentleman's is on this side, the ladies on that side on this level. Uh, but Glenda assures me that the ladies on uh, the ground level is particularly worth a visit. It's quite an elegant loo, and uh, you will be rewarded for visiting there, ladies. So uh, we encourage you to be aware of all those uh, toilets and, and, and use them all. Uh, when the bell rings, we've got about half an hour for tea. When the bell rings, please move back into the theater. Uh, your punctuality will be re rewarded with some excellent music and some entertainment that you won't want to miss. Workshop two this afternoon and workshop four tomorrow afternoon are virtually full. If you have not signed up for those, don't despair, as there's plenty of room here in the Embassy Theater, this place, for workshops one and three. Uh, there is another option, and that's for you to join the party going to Zealandia. Uh, the Zealandia visit is courtesy of the Alan Wilson Center, so there's no extra cost to you. But we do ask that you register for that at the registration desk in front, uh, either now or uh, over lunch, if you'd like to change and do that. Uh, short of that, uh, I'll see you back here just before 11 a.m., uh, and we'll begin again, uh, and there will be an announcement, too, to remind you of that. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. It's my great pleasure now to introduce Kim Hill. Uh, Kim will be well known to this audience. She's well known to all New Zealanders, especially the 300,000 of us who listen to her weekly on Radio New Zealand. Uh, Kim is also famous 
other places. She's famous in London where last November she was named the 2012 International Radio Personality of the Year uh, by the Association for International Broadcasting. And in May, Kim was presented the gold medal for best talk show host at the 2013 New York Festival Radio Awards. Exceptional. Kim's contribution to educating us about science and sustainability issues has been substantial and in the most interesting ways possible always. So it's absolutely fantastic that Kim is here today and tomorrow to guide our panelists through these thorny issues that they will be addressing. Kim, thank you so much. It's absolutely wonderful to have you here, and it's your turn now. Kim, let's welcome Kim. Thank you, Charles. Um, Pavan Sukhdev's a hard act to follow, isn't he? There will be more to come. Let me introduce the, uh, the panel that we have today. Dr. Girog Harajulu is Deputy Secretary and Chief Economist at Treasury. His career has included roles at the Reserve Bank, National Bank, West Pac. He's on record as saying there's a huge opportunity in New Zealand to promote equitable and sustainable economic growth through appropriate economic policies. So we'll explore equitable and sustainable perhaps during the panel discussion. James Palmer is Deputy Secretary at the Ministry of the Environment, which means he's responsible for a number of things, including the National Resource Sector Support Unit and the Business Growth Agenda Resources Stream. Dr. Marianne van der Belt is Director of Ecological Economics Research at Massey. As an ecological economist, she's worked on ecosystem service evaluation, investing in natural capital. She's co-developed an eco-village in Vermont. Uh, and Dr. Jonathan Boston holds a chair in public policy at Victoria University. He's director of the Institute for Governance and Policy Studies. He's written about eliminating world poverty, climate change, and peace in the Middle East. I made that last one up. <laughs> <laughs> but feel free. Um, I'm going to ask them to speak for, you know, five or six minutes first of all, and then we'll kick around some stuff. And then I want questions from you people. So when I say any questions, um, I want you all to hasten towards the microphone. Otherwise, I get embarrassed, and there's a dull silence, and we fidget, and everything falls apart. Right. Uh, can I invite, first of all, Dr. Marianne van den Belt oh, to address thank you. us? Thank you. Get to do the catwalk. Uh, it's OK, right? Uh, well, you can go anywhere you want, yeah, yeah. apparently. Okay. <laughs> Right. If you're comfortable up there, or you can stay here. <laughs> I'm good here. Right. So, Tena Koto Katoa. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, at this very important com conference. It could be a, a, a milestone, a changing point in, uh, in what we're doing here in New Zealand. Uh, Pavan Sukhdev, of course, a hard act to follow, uh, to follow. I could make it very short and basically say everything he says uh, and, and sit down. Uh, however, I am going to take my five minutes in the spotlight today and, and basically emphasize the fact that many countries in the developed world have indeed entered a period of uneconomic growth. That's how I'd like to call it. Um, and not valuing the benefits that we derive from ecosystem services is a major part of that, as we've heard this morning. Not understanding the distributive fairness of that is, is also an aspect of it. So in the next five minutes, I would like to share my vision as an ecological economist of what the ecosystem service paradigm can mean for New Zealand. In uh, 97, so I'll go back a little bit, I was part of a research project that uh, conservatively estimated the global value of ecosystem services at about $3 trillion per year. Uh, this was about twice the size as global GDP at that point, and you, you, many of you may well be uh, aware of this, uh, of this landmark article. A lot of ha happened since then. It's become a, almost a, a paradigm, this paradigm shift, this ecosystem services approach, and it provides a common language to focus on the benefits that we derive from these ecosystems. Now, the ecosystem services value, evaluation approach has been applied in many projects, as Pavan has showed earlier uh, in the morning. So sure, we can, can do evaluation of these projects, of this 
within the existing economic paradigm. Um, and Pavan has given us all the examples. I don't need to go in there. In, in there. Um, and there's an end to it. We can go beyond this total economic valuation approach and consider the full potential that this ecosystem services potential uh, paradigm holds for us. Ecosystem services are clearly produced at different levels. They are uh, produced at a, a very local level. Uh, soil formation, for example, is produced and used at a very local level. Water, water regulation, mountains to the sea, there's a more of, of a flow effect to it, all the way to those global cycles that Havan has showed us in, in terms of the planetary boundaries. So, in other words, there is a multi-scale challenge in front of us. And here's why New Zealand has much to gain from an actual multi-scale, integrated and collaborative approach to ecosystem services. First of all, I'm going to just run a list by you. New Zealand is very well endowed, natural capital, and abundance is easily taken for granted. So in a, in a way, it's an advantage and a disadvantage. New Zealand stands much to gain from making these ecosystem services visible because it creates an, an, a competitive advantage in international markets. Also, of course, number three, there's meaningful employment associated with investments in natural capital. And it will address the growing uh, inequality that, we, that New Zealand experiences. It will be financially impossible, of course, to continue substituting natural capital for man-made capital. And please ask questions. I can give you some New Zealand examples where that shows up. Uh, because New Zealand is an island, it has the unique ability to design perhaps a one-year multi-scale plan and taking those values of ecosystem services into account. This would give us uh, an opportunity to, to look at the hotspots for investments in the natural infrastructure that appear across the entire landscape, from the local to the regional to the national and even the global scales. These ecosystem services are produced and used across the entire landscape. So they're not only produced in conservation areas, it's conservation, it's agricultural land, it's urban, urban land, all the way to the sea. So we need to find a way to look at all of these services together. Um, yeah. And then finally, I think that um, including all of these areas, and all ecosystem services to start with at multiple scales will start allowing us a way to talk about how we make our, our trade-offs and our decision more, more transparent. So here's my vision. I am going to read this one. Um, in about 100 years, New Zealand has recovered from the current period of uneconomic growth. It is economically developing. We maintain a natural capital base as essential infrastructure. This ecological infrastructure has left us less vulnerable, but not immune to a changed climate. We use technology and economic activities to work with natural capital. Lower dependency on financial capital has left New Zealand more resilient toward global financial upsets. New institutions have emerged and give voice to the integrity of common assets and take into account the voices of future generations. Diversity is celebrated as a source of creativity. Returns on investment is measured in return on nat natural, social, human, as well as buildings and financial capital. The ability to engage with complex challenges in a collaborative way is leading to innovations in unforeseen ways. We have created institutions that provide meaningful employment with activities that stay within the ecological carrying capacity. We are global citizens. Other countries, especially island nations, find the New Zealand model inspirational. The CEO of New Zealand is evaluated on how she maintains the common assets. How do we live off the interest of our natural capital rather than eating into our assets? Now this vision for um, a society that values these capitals is perhaps inspirational to some, but it is at the same time a terrifying one. It is, uh, 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 yeah, some people are simply fearful of it. Um, a vision, I want to say, 
It's judged by its clarity, not by its implementation pathway. So from a, for example, a 100-year vision, we can collaboratively backtrack and, and talk about, have conversations about what is needed in order to achieve goals in 50 years, 20 years, 10 years, next year. What is it that such a vision inspires us to do right now? It is very encouraging to see in New Zealand that the ecosystem services approach is popping up in various spatial planning exercises, whether in conservation, marine spatial planning in the Hauriki Gulf, rural spatial planning, Waikato, um, and urban spatial planning in Auckland. So why not stitch those pieces together? Why not develop a multi-scale integrated ecosystem services approach for the whole of New Zealand? And I leave this to ponder for you. When you look at a thing differently, the thing itself changes. I look forward to the panel discussion. Would you prefer? Um, thanks, Marianne, Dr. Jonathan Bosch. I should make the point, Jonathan, that you can oh. stay with the play. I'll, right? I'll, okay. I'll follow in the footsteps. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Kim. Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa. It's a great pleasure to be here. As you can see, I'm not Gareth Morgan, so sorry to disappoint. May I congratulate the wonderful team of people who arranged this terrific event. I'm well aware of the enormous effort and time required for organizing conferences of this nature, so heartiest congratulations. Let me just offer five brief comments. First, humanity owes Pavan and his TEEB team an enormous debt. The T project has produced some immensely useful and important reports. Pavan has highlighted some of the main findings and conclusions earlier today, but there is a wealth of material available online. Unfortunately, uh, this rich analytical, empirical and policy work is not sufficiently well known, even amongst leading environmental policy experts around the world. Thankfully, this conference will help rectify this deficiency, at least in this part of the world. Second, I want to endorse the work of our Treasury here in New Zealand in its recent efforts to develop a richer and broader conceptual framework to guide its policy thinking, including its emphasis on the different types of capital, including natural capital, and I'm sure Gero will say more about this in a moment. This living standards framework appropriately recognizes the vital importance of natural capital and ecosystem services for economic development, social progress, and human flourishing. The new framework has many strengths, but much work remains to be done. For instance, the existing approach to sustainability issues and natural capital is inadequate. It lacks sufficient discussion of strong and weak sustainability, including the role of critical natural capital, that is non-renewable and non-substitutable capital nor is there an adequate analysis of the ethical and methodological issues surrounding the valuation of natural capital, including concepts like option value, existence value, and bequest value that Pavan referred to earlier today. Indeed, the current framework has a strongly instrumentalist orientation. Nature, it seems, is valuable only to the extent that it benefits human beings. The intrinsic value of ecosystems, individual species, and landscapes is largely ignored. This deficiency needs rectification. Third, as Pavan emphasized earlier today, we need clear thinking about the nature of value and the moral limits to markets. We should not commodify and monetize everything. We should not confuse the dollar value we can ascribe to ecosystems or the services they provide with their real or true value. For one thing, placing monetary values on ecosystems is beset with methodological problems, and these are well documented in the various TEEB reports. For another, valuing nature solely in monetary terms raises profound ethical issues and objections. In my view, there are different kinds of goods and services and different dimensions of value. These are uh, different kinds of goods and services need to be valued in fundamentally different ways. This means that some values are inconsumentable. That is, they cannot be judged against the same standard or benchmark. They cannot be reduced to a common currency. So 
such as a dollar value. We should not, for instance, seek to put a dollar price on love or compassion or justice. Likewise, ecosystems and the services they provide should never be valued purely in monetary terms. To be sure, we can, of course, calculate the likely cost to farmers of replicating the pollination services provided by bees and other insect pollinators, as Pavan mentioned. And globally, the dollar value is huge. In 2005, it was estimated to be around 300 billion New Zealand dollars per annum and accounted for 10% of the world's agricultural output. But we should not assume that this represents the real or total value of bees as if their only value is their commercial role as pollinators and honey producers. Despite this, let me affirm that in my view there is a strong case for quantifying and estimating the dollar value of ecosystem services. Indeed, if we do not, we risk placing zero value on such services, as we've tended to do in the past, or severely underestimating their value. This is why the TEED project and similar efforts internationally, including the wonderful work that Marianne and her colleagues have done over many, many years, why that work is so vitally important. But equally, we must avoid thinking that the monetary values generated through various economic valuation methods represent the true value. We must affirm that prices can never capture all that is of value. We must beware of knowing the price of everything, yet the value of nothing. Fourth, the task ahead, in terms of building the kind of vision that Marianne has wonderfully outlined, the task ahead is tremendously challenging. Far too many political and business leaders, both here and overseas, lack a proper understanding of ecology and ecological economics. And their ignorance is not only disturbing, it is positively dangerous. The current New Zealand government, for instance, is only too eager to proclaim the virtues of our country's favorite brands, clean and green, 100% pure. But the very same government is pursuing policies on multiple fronts that are making an absolute mockery of such brands. Examples include the severe weakening of the emissions trading scheme, the vigorous endorsement of onshore and offshore mining of fossil fuels with no mention of carbon capture and storage, reduced public funding for dock, huge investments in new roads rather than public transport, the inefficient expansion of urban boundaries, and numerous proposed changes to the Resource Management Act designed to lower environmental standards, fast track major projects, and limit citizens' participatory and legal rights. This is not good. Globally and locally, we desperately need an ecological revolution at all levels of society. We need to understand the enormous economic and non-economic value of our natural capital, the huge ecological damage we are currently inflicting, and the grave risks which current policy settings pose for future generations. The T project has been of immense value in all these respects. Finally, let us not forget the urgency of the task, which Pavan alerted us to in his closing remarks. The damage to global ecosystems and their services and biodiversity is acute and accelerating. We are exceeding safe planetary boundaries. We are running out of time. We need to act thoughtfully, but we need to act very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. But what do you really think about cats? I don't know. <laughs> um, they, should be, uh, they should be tamed. <laughs> and good morning, everyone. Um, I, I wanted to talk this morning a little bit about, uh, about the relevance uh, and the relationships and the disconnects uh, between people and natural systems. And I thought I'd just start by um, telling a little, little story about something that's not very well known, and that's that in 2008, when Lehman Brothers fell over, uh, at that point in time, New Zealand's largest company, Fonterra, had about $400 million worth of debt that it needed to roll over. And there was a real challenge to, uh, to placing that debt. And uh, at the time, uh, there was a, a very genuine concern about a flow-on effect. 
Fonterra at that point had uh, over 60% uh, debt to equity ratio. And uh, because uh, farmer payout is subordinate to all their, uh, their other debts, uh, the consequence uh, of the, uh, the company uh, not being able to service its debts uh, would flow on through into the balance sheets of farmers around New Zealand. And the New Zealand banking system is heavily exposed to the agricultural sector. So we were facing at that point in time a, a sovereign debt crisis. Now, it wasn't spoken about because we didn't want to let markets uh, get uh, too familiar with the circumstances while we were busily uh, sorting things uh, in, in the back room. Now the good thing for New Zealand was that uh, it was sorted and life moved on and actually the one thing that saved New Zealand from becoming a Greece or an Iceland through that period given our debt profile in large measure uh, was high dairy commodity prices. Uh, the point of, uh, of that story is that uh, many New Zealanders are blissfully unaware that uh, their economic uh, well-being, that the standard of living we enjoy in New Zealand, uh, our cost of living, is heavily driven uh, by the exports of our agricultural sector. Uh, and and that, uh, that matters because, as uh, Al Morrison pointed out earlier on today, uh, we have some, some real leakage in our production systems. We're losing uh, topsoil, uh, we're losing nutrient into our waterways, we have degrading water bodies in some of our intensive uh, pastoral catch catchments. So New Zealand's uh, economic and uh, social and environmental well-being is absolutely tied to the performance uh, of our, our primary industries. And it's uh, just not clear to me uh, often when people are concerned with uh, the environmental performance of the dairy industry that they also understand that every time they fill their, their petrol tank uh, or they buy a new car or an iPod or a flat screen TV that somewhere near quarter, quarter of the foreign exchange that's paid for that has come from the agricultural sector. Um, in New Zealand, we've had a, a history of uh, running campaigns quite successfully, quite adversarial politics around the environment. And I'd like to argue that uh, we actually need a, a, a new settlement. Natural resources are, by their very nature, typically shared, they're frequently uh, finite, and when they're renewable, there are genuine constraints on, on the rate of use. Now, that creates real tensions uh, between people and within communities and over generations. And uh, that high tendency for adversariality and conflict leads to policy instability, uh, regulatory uncertainty, and a blame culture where it's not my problem, it's your problem. And it goes backwards and forwards, and governments come and go and we continue to argue. Sometimes we make some progress, sometimes we go backwards. Uh, but I would argue that that's not good for the economy, it's not good for the environment. And we do need that greater settlement, we need it for both investment certainty, much better to plan an economy and build an economy in that way, uh, and we also need it to ensure greater long-term sustainability. I think in New Zealand we're transitioning from uh, resource management being about finding out where those limits lie through biophysical sciences and creating some, some bottom lines and then allowing as much use as possible within those bottom lines to moving to a more integrated view of the full range of societal values that we're trying to derive from resource use. Um, we've we've uh, introduced a few market-based uh, instruments when there's been allocation, uh, over-allocation, um, and, and there's been some success, as the Minister of Conservation mentioned this morning, with respect to fisheries management. Um, Market-based instruments do give us good uh, preference revelation and they help migrate to highest value use. They can make real problem, uh, progress, but uh, we do have real issues with, with those sort of management regimes when futures are overly discounted, there's huge information uncertainty, and non-monetary uh, values uh, are often not well accommodated. And then when we try to, uh, to uh, manage resources more dynamically, through using precautionary approaches or more adaptive management, we come up against uh, use rights that people have paid for. And so it makes it extraordinarily difficult uh, to manage effectively uh, once those, uh, those property rights have been created. So I just wanted to, to, to make a note of caution uh, today, and I, I think Pavan made the point well this morning, uh, that market-based instruments have a place, uh, but they are, not a, they are not a be all and end all. The other point I wanted to make is that um, uh, information is extraordinarily important. Uh, but I'm not convinced that information necessarily changes uh, behaviour. Uh, we assume a degree of rationality, and if we better understand uh, stocks and flows in the economy, the costs of an action, we put big numbers in front of people that they will respond. We've had some big numbers around the environment for you know, 40 plus years, and we still have many uh, pervasive problems. So um, trying to get to the heart of the behavioural issues and the way people respond uh, to the environmental challenges, the natural resource management challenges we've got, is very much the challenge facing the natural resource sector of government at the moment. And uh, we're at the moment developing a, uh, a, a policy framework 
that uh, seeks to, to better understand these interactions. And it has, uh, it has, it has two uh, fundamental components that I, I, I wanted to mention. One is understanding the relationship between social uh, and ecological systems. And uh, we have an emerging understanding and a growing understanding and an enormous need to continue to understand the nature of that relationship. It's a bit like a marriage, really. Uh, you're never done learning about each other, uh, and so we need to continually work at understanding that, understanding those relationships. And it's not just those relationships uh, between social and ecological systems, it's within ecological systems and within social systems. So understanding the way people relate to one another. So the second part of our analytical framework uh, that we are seeking to develop at the moment and hope to launch next month uh, is to look at the behavioural elements that, uh, that are at play when people respond to the information they're confronted with and really understand the incentives uh, that drive behaviour and how we can create uh, institutions that, that change that behaviour. And a big part of that is recognising the broad range of values uh, that communities and individuals hold uh, for natural resource uh, questions and environmental questions. The framework we're adopting um, it builds on existing practice, it builds on existing tools, and you can see it uh, being uh, quite similar to the uh, National Objectives Framework for, uh, for fresh water that uh, government has been consulting on, and tomorrow the Minister uh, for the Environment will, will, will speak some more about that. But what we're really trying to do there is get away from this idea that biophysical sciences are going to give us the answer. Uh, and that we can put rules in place that prevent people from doing the worst and then allowing them to do whatever uh, in, a, in, a, in a freedom space, to getting communities to come together and to really confront uh, the different values that they, that they hold uh, and to work through to some degree of reconciliation where possible and some very uh, uh, explicit trade-offs where they're necessary. And that's something that takes an awful lot of time and energy, and it's a different way of doing natural resource management. It gets away from this past practice in New Zealand of adversariality and conflict and contest, which I would argue in large measure is what the Resource Management Act was uh, originally built on, an, an idea that markets would uh, distribute uh, within the economy quite efficiently, and if we have an adversarial uh, system, particularly in front of the Environment Court, uh, we will get uh, good outcomes. And I think for both the economy and the environment, there is a serious question mark as to whether the Resource Management Act has actually done the business for New Zealand. And it has got some degree of religion attached to it, uh, and I think we do need to think beyond it, and we need to think about ways in which uh, we can actually get more proactive planning in this uh, country rather than relying on adversarial processes involving more collaborative processes, and it was good to hear right at the start uh, a vision for New Zealand that involved more collaboration and integration where we really confront uh, the collective values we have and we seek to understand uh, those different values and we try uh, to find innovative ways uh, and new ways of, of, of uh, behaving and operating. Uh, the final thing I, I really just wanted to say is that New Zealand is a very, very wealthy country indeed when we think, uh, if we think about our natural uh, capital endowment. And uh, there is a risk, of course, that uh, we, we put all that on the balance sheet and then somebody comes along and says it's a rather lazy balance sheet and you need to be extracting more value from that asset base. Um, so uh, understanding uh, the stocks that we have is very important, but I would argue that even more important is understanding the flows uh, and that is particularly relevant to ecosystem services, so it's particularly relevant to uh, what we derive uh, from the natural resource base, but also what we put back into it uh, and our, uh, our uh, management uh, interaction, but also a much broader set of values uh, that we derive uh, from our natural capital. So in the, uh, the, the next month or so, uh, the natural resource sector will be uh, talking to a range of stakeholders and we'll certainly be keen to talk um, to, to anybody and everybody in this room about how we're trying to evolve uh, policy development uh, and decision-making frameworks in New Zealand that can be more inclusive and ultimately more resilient uh, and more enduring. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, I apparently muted myself earlier in case you just saw my lips moving and nothing came out. Save some of you the trouble, that's what I thought. Kiro Kalajulu, thank you. Thank you. Just to be different and to please, Kim, I'll stay where I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to Pavan Suhde for an excellent presentation and uh, to him and his wider team for the brilliant work they are doing on this uh, broader issue.
Um, and also thank you for everyone who uh, has organized, contributed to organizing this, uh, this conference. It's extremely precious and valuable. In the five or uh, six minutes I have, uh, I'll just uh, give you a sense of how the kind of issues we are talking about here feed into the way Treasury, the New Zealand Treasury, is increasingly formulating its economic uh, policy advice. The um, basic concept that uh, we are using uh, is the broader living standards framework. And increasingly, in formulating wider economic policy advice, uh, we are saying uh, that um, we should focus on much more than simply economic growth. Uh, we should be focusing on a uh, wider concept of prosperity. The question is, how do we operationalize this? These are very nice words, but as Pavan said, how do we bring all the fantastic work that's being done in all these areas into the hands of decision makers and policy advisors? Following the OECD, we have focused on trying to operationalizing this by focusing on a wider concept of the capital stock of New Zealand. And we are framing our policy as uh, building, protecting, and sharing, sharing across society and across generations that wider capital stock and the flow of goods that flows from it. Uh, the capital stock categories we are using so far are financial and physical capital, human capital, social capital, and natural capital in its widest sense. These are, as I said earlier, nice concepts, um, and many PhD theses are being written on these matters. Um, the OECD and others are doing a lot of work, so the question is how do we take the next step to operationalize that in guiding policy? That took us to thinking about our wider concept of social welfare, and we said what does really matter? Uh, we identified so far, and I keep saying so far, it's a very consultative process working across the wider public sector as well, that one of the key dimensions of wider well-being is income and employment, uh, which we broadly refer to e as economic growth. The other one is sustainability. The third one is equity, equity both intra- and intergenerational. The fourth one is social infrastructure, social cohesion. And the final one is managing risk. So our living standards or prosperity cobweb, as it were, has those five corners. And what we're saying is if we can design policies that expand that cobweb, then we are implicitly, by implication, expanding the social and other forms of capital and sharing it with uh, the people here and across generations. In this context, one of the challenges we face is not to be seen as being anti-growth. Uh, we are taking account of wider prosperity. That doesn't mean we are against growth. To use the language of Ajemolo and Robinson in their beautiful book, Why Nations Fail, there is good growth and there is extractive growth. Good growth, as Pavan also said, is that which expands our wider capital stock and it, it makes it available to everyone. So it is sustainable growth. It is inclusive and equitable growth. It is not anti-growth. The other challenge we face is to move away from constantly thinking of trade-offs and thinking of policies that are mutually reinforcing so that we are thinking of the policies that expand that cobweb, as it were. A brilliant example being education, especially opportunities and capabilities provided to the lowest income people. 
because when you think of it that way, they will participate in economic life productively. That's growth. It's equitable. You're not giving them fish. You're teaching them how to fish. It is sustainable because it's not handouts. It uh, contributes social cohesion, and it manages the widest sense of social risk. So that's the way we are trying to formulate and prioritize our policies. Instead of saying, give me the top 30 priorities about how we will generate higher economic growth, we are saying, let's prioritize on the basis of the policies that will expand that cobweb. The other challenge we face is, in terms of operationalizing, developing measures for these things so we can monitor progress and we can use them. And in that regard, I am very grateful on behalf of the whole public sector that we have a fantastic working relationship with Statistics New Zealand. They have 80 plus measures of progress. They have mapped those measures into those five corners. We've organized a, a conference with uh, 19 agencies around New Zealand, all public sector, uh, national and local, started to talk about how we can use all this. Under the government economics network, which I head, we created a website specifically dedicated to the broader living standards uh, framework. We created hubs within it for each corner, encouraging people, academics, public sector people, and uh, public servants to work together to explore ways of using this for policy purposes. Uh, this is about us working collectively to get towards good policy, and that's the whole purpose of the exercise. Within Treasury, we are saying to all our analysts, whatever policy area you're working on, whether it's fiscal, macro, housing, poverty, education, natural capital, whatever it may be, infrastructure, always think of the wider living standards framework as a way of guiding and prioritizing those policies. I'm delighted to say there is a huge interest in this area. Unfortunately, young people come to us and say, give us a template to use this. And I say, it's a matter of learning together I don't have a template. So that's our challenge, but it's also extremely exciting. So to, to summarize, uh, it's very early days. Uh, we are making very small progress. We are trying to be very practical about this. And one of the main motives for me to um, attend these kinds of uh, sessions is I'm hoping that there's a genius sitting in the audience who will say, I know how to do this, it's very trivial. And then they'll come us and hope uh, they will tell us how to apply it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, a question has kind of recurred to me um, in the course of the morning, and I'm going to ask you, Marianne, about it. Is the division between renewable and non-renewable wrong and distorting now? Because it seems to me, I mean, I'm thinking about Pavan's brilliant graph about the, the fragility of the winds. Everything is non-renewable if somebody takes more than their bit. Is that right? Yeah. So we can forget that distinction now. All that preciousness about renewable, non-renewable, blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's no, no, no. I, it, it's, it's about uh, time frames, how, how long things are you know, renewed for or... I mean, a forest re regenerates itself so over a couple of decades, and then you know, it can be used in a certain way at a certain level. It's a matter of then recognizing what kind of services do you want from it, maintaining it at least to the level that those services are still intact. It's such a delicate balancing it act, is. you know. And Jonathan, it's clear what needs to be done, but how to do it? I mean, is just one example, Pavan's shrimp farm example, right? Mm -hmm. Mangroves. Trump jobs. Mm -hmm. How do you sell that on the West Coast? <laughs> Assuming they had mangroves on the West Coast, all right already. Well, I, I think in some cases there are very hard trade-offs. And, and but, but we've just heard, you well, know, forget about the trade-offs. Well, no, we, we can't forget about the trade-offs, I'm afraid, because sometimes there are trade-offs. Uh, but we have to think about this both, you know, temporally and intertemporally. In other words, uh, over over 
uh, short periods of time as well as longer periods of time. So that, so Governments that, that have three years, Jonathan, well, you that, know that. I know, and one of the problems we have is we have a political incentive structure which is, which is myopic. It focuses people's attention very much on short-term um, costs and benefits, not on the longer-term costs and benefits. So you and mean people are so superficial that they worry about where their next pay packet is coming from? Well, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, negative about this, but that is the reality. That is yeah. the short-term, long-term thing is the huge block on this, isn't it? Sure, and it's perfectly reasonable that people will focus on their pay packets, particularly if they're relatively modestly paid and they don't have significant savings and if they don't have a, an adequate sort of safety net to fall back on in terms of community support through the welfare state and so on. So. Uh, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the good reasons for having a welfare state, in my view, and a reasonably generous one, is that it provides a basis for people to fall back on in a context where you do want to move people out of industries that are damagingly extractive and into, into things which are going to be more sustainable in the long run. So, so all these things have to be thought about collectively. Uh, as a matter of interest, given your pungent critique of the government and its extractive industries, yeah. when, when the minister, Nick Smith, who I think is no longer here, um, uh, when he says New Zealand, you know, has great public accounting systems and the polarised debate over the economy versus the environment is a waste of time, I take it you're saying, yeah, and the government's decided to shortcut it by going for the economy rather than the environment. Is that what you're saying? I, I, I think so. I, right. I think that, unfortunately, at the moment, we have a government that doesn't fully grasp the um, economic and non-economic value of natural capital and ecosystem services. And, and as a consequence, they're, 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 they're getting short shrift. And one of the good things about what's going on in the public service at the moment, in terms of the work the Treasury is doing, the Stats is doing, and other departments like the Ministry for the Environment are doing, in terms of building frameworks, building information systems, and so on, is that over time, we will hopefully have more information that's relevant for policymakers that can help frame and shape decision making. But, but part of the challenge at the moment is the mindset People just don't have the right mindset. They don't understand the sort of thing that Pavan uh, was explaining this morning. So Nick Smith may understand it, but lots of his cabinet colleagues, in my view, don't. And lots of, lots of other people in significant places within the wider community don't. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's taken so long to get progress on, 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 on issues. And it's not just a problem for New Zealand. If you think about climate change, we've known the basic problem for two or three decades. And we've made very little progress because of the, of the limited un understanding, but also the powerful vested interests that try and resist change. Um, I was thinking about those fishing boats, you know, Pavan's chart about the, how more and more fishing boats have to go out and bring back less and less catch. Is there, James, let me ask you, do you think that there is a parallel between that and the dairy industry? <coughs> if we were yep. to do a complete accounting of the dairy industry, would we come out plus or minus? Um, I think in both industries you are to uh, some extent running down your natural capital and mm -hmm. over a long time frame, uh, most of New Zealand's pastoral landscape, if we're talking hundreds of years, potentially thousands, will go the way of just about every agricultural uh, economy in the history of humanity. Uh, we will end up with rocks and desert. Um, that's, that's likely to be the case over a long time frame. And it's, it's probably true that no society in the history of humanity has managed to organise itself in a way that is truly sustainable over the long term. That remains a challenge for New Zealand and it remains a challenge for humanity. Because, you see, if we bring in the total accounting system, New Zealand is going to be really at the bottom of the barrel there because everybody's going to be suddenly enlightened. And they're going to look at us and they're going to think, well, not even 1% pure. <laughs> you know, we're completely extractive. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that's fair. I think it, it, is, well, it is true to say that uh, many of our primary production systems are extracting at a greater rate than they are uh, returning or remediating. Uh, but that's not to say that everyone within the industry is uh, operating that kind of model. We've got fantastic farmers in New Zealand that have uh, all of their erosion country well planted up. They have strong riparian uh, uh, planting and, and fencing. Uh, they are very calibrated in the use of, of whatever nutrients they add. And their stocking rates are at, at, a, at, a, at a level that's uh, relatively uh, sustainable. 
but I think it's still yet to be proven. I don't think sustain sustainable is like pregnant, though, isn't it? You can't be relatively sustainable. You can't be a little bit... Sus it's sustainable or not sustainable. Well, well, that's the point, I think, is that actually we haven't, we haven't had intensive agricultural systems on the planet long enough and successfully enough, enough anywhere to demonstrate that over hundreds of years or thousands of years that the way in which we, we go about our production um, can be uh, done in perpetuity. All right, so we're an experiment. Um, life's an experiment. We're in uncharted territory as, uh, as a civilization. no question about that. Let me talk to you, you're all about the Europe pains treasury is not, uh, pains not to be seen as anti-growth. I guess that there's not many people who would see treasury as a band of anti-growth green zealots, <laughs> <laughs> but keep working on that one. Um, do you concur with Parvan's distinction between good growth and bad growth? I absolutely concur with it. Um, uh, absolutely. People talk about um, inclusive growth uh, and extractive growth. That's Ajem Alder and Robinson's sweep of history. Um, and New Zealand delightfully is listed as one of those countries that have benefited from inclusive growth. I absolutely support Pavan's uh, operationalization of good growth is growth that instead of focusing on GDP or GDP per head of population talks about total wealth and expanding our aggregate capital stock in its widest sense, human capital, physical, natural, social, uh, and designing our policies to achieve that. Uh, that is totally aligned with the way we're looking at it. It's about growing it, protecting it, sharing it. Uh, and designing policies that will achieve that. Education, housing are two examples that are very dear to my heart because I think that its health is another one where it really works if you think about it that way. So yes, I love it. But you need a certain amount, let me put it to uh -huh. you, a certain amount of ostensibly bad growth in order to acquire the money under the existing global systems in order to acquire the money to put into good growth. There's the trade-off, isn't it? No, you don't need bad growth. Um, if you want to put uh, your focus on good growth supporting education, it's about making sure society at large agrees that it's part of its tax income is going to be devoted to education and within that, to the lowest five, six, seven percent of the population who are constantly stuck in the basement of the apartment block, as it were. And uh, that, that's, there is no trade-off there. Uh, everybody wins uh, because the whole cobweb expands. But I do accept Jonathan's point, of course, that in a lot of cases there are trade-offs. All I was saying is that it would be lovely to en keep encouraging ourselves to look at economic policy as mutually reinforcing rather than constantly talking about trade-offs. Um, if there are trade-offs, let's face it, but I get excited about policies that expand the cobweb. That's all I care about. It's good. Um, I don't want to deprive any of you guys of responding to each other, but I also don't want to deprive the audience. So if you want to say anything... Can I just, just James, respond to jo Jonathan's comment about, uh, about the current government? And I'd just make the observation that I think that every New Zealand government since 1840 has put people ahead of the environment. There have been many governments that have created national parks. The current government has created uh, marine reserves. They've got a whole range of initiatives uh, that are good for the environment. But overall, New Zealand society has chosen and societies the world over choose to put people ahead of the environment. Uh, governments do not lead, governments follow. That is how democracy works. <coughs> this is about social choices and societal's, uh, societal values. But if you're really going to change the paradigm, you're going to have to say that people are the environment. It's not okay. people or the environment, it's people in the environment. The, the dependency that we all have on the environment needs to be more relevant uh, and front of centre in people's minds and then they will, uh, their, their values will evolve to, uh, to reflect the real choices that they're confronted with, yeah. which are currently obscure. E James, if I could quickly respond, I, I think we elect governments to do a number of things, but one of them is to lead, 
Um, I, I, mean, I don't have a notion of, of, of a government that purely follows. <laughs> Go governments uh, have to lead on some issues, and in my view, while I fully acknowledge that there are some good things that this government has done in relation to the broad conservation environmental area, including supporting the work of the Treasury in terms of its living standards framework uh, and so forth, um, in broad terms, I, I don't think the government has done a good job on environmental matters. It is extremely rare ever to hear any of the senior ministers talking about environmental issues. For example, when did you hear the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister uh, talk about you know, climate change and its importance and, and its critical uh, potential impact on New Zealand and so on? Um, there's complete silence. Uh, uh, so I, I think we have to call a spade a spade. You know, we, we, we have a government that is not serving the environment and thus is not serving future generations well. We need to say that and we need to do something about it. All right. <laughs> That's enough of that anti-government business. <laughs> um, would somebody like to advance on the microphone and ask any member of the panel a question? Go. G'day. It is, can everyone hear? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bernie Knapp. I work for the mining industry, as it happens. Uh, but I have a question to, to anybody who wants to answer it and, and uh, listen to your conversation. I like the stalk rice example from Pavan's talk because it's about some factors for success combining to get the direction of travel in the right direction in that small example. And, uh, and when I was on the Land and Water Forum, the conversation was about getting the direction of travel right. So the question is... How do we identify those factors for success in a place like New Zealand and get this virtuous circle going to get the direction of travel going in the right direction? Good question. What are you mining, by the way? I, I work for Stratera, which is the advocacy body. So we uh, have in our membership coal, gold, iron sands, gravel. Um, and, and some of the offshore explorers as well. And specifically, your question was what? How do we...? Well, the thing about the stalk rice example is here's something that works in a way that builds natural capital rather than taking from it away. What were the factors of success that combined to make that work? And what's the pattern? <coughs> and how can we roll that out in New Zealand? We've got some examples in New Zealand, but how do you make it a national thing? Thank you. Can I did I take the point from Pavan, actually, and let me, let me ask you this, um, Giro. The stork were encouraged to come back by subsidies paid to farming in order to be organic. Treasury's view on subsidies in a good cause? Treasury's views on subsidies on a good cause are very positive. The, uh, the issue is um, as long as we don't uh, uh, have a negative effect on incentives, uh, then, uh, Some would argue that subsidies are always a negative effect on market incentives. Don't not necessarily. <coughs> Let me give you an example. When you uh, subsidize people to, uh, to or say, in my world, Kiwi saver and long-term saving and all that kind of stuff, that's good for the individual, that's good for the country, that's good for everyone. You're saying people are not super rational. You nudge them a little bit, and they may do the good thing for themselves and for everyone else. That's a good example where subsidies are totally aligned with positive incentives. There are others where they are not. I totally That's accept right. that. Sorry, I, I deflected yeah. from the gentleman's question. Yeah, I would like to go back to the yes. mining, uh, mining question. Because it's a, it's a social contract at that point. Um, if we're now saying, okay, there's this renewable, or this non-renewable resource, it's being mined, um, can we then start seeing as an, as an investment? Yes, it's good to, to invest some of those, uh, those revenues that we get right now into other forms of e ecological infrastructures, such as maintaining an ecosystem and learning from it. But there has to be a social contract with the company back again into recognizing that it is living off a non-renewable resource and what are the ways to get out of that in the bigger picture. There has to be that constant social uh, contract that needs to be designed. So it's not a one-time off, or we, we pay you know, in order to do all this, this, this good work in an, in an, and, and, and support this ecosystem and learning about it. The company has to learn from that. 
uh, and do things fundamentally different and hopefully get itself out of, of, of that particular business and use the skills, the human capital, into creating a new business with meaningful jobs that don't need the, the, the non-renewable resources. Could I just ask, offer a footnote, which is that in, in addition to the fact that mining in this case is, is depleting uh, natural capital, it, it, it's also in the case of fossil fuels uh, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So it, we know, therefore, that that is going to be having you know, damaging long-term consequences. We already have more than enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's already increasing the globe's temperature and doing damage. In my view, we should not be entering into any more fossil fuel extraction. I know, but then you get into without, the argument about you make the money out of fossil fuel and put no, it into well, renewable technology. Well, we, we should certainly be imposing an, a, 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 a realistic price on carbon. We are not at the moment. And more particularly, in, in my view, we should be seriously thinking about not ha having additional coal mining uh, without carbon capture and storage. Um, because if, if, if we don't take this seriously, well, we are going to you know, do immense, irreversible damage to critical biophysical systems all over the planet. So you know, we have to look at It's that global consciousness, though. I mean, you know, we're so small and we're well, so poor. Why can't we just do it? No, I mean, because everyone can take the same attitude. We can all free ride. But we have no moral right to free ride. And I just don't buy the argument that, you know, we, we, we should simply say, oh, well, because someone else is doing it, we should do it. I, Jonathan I, Boston, speaking for the moral right, who'd have thought? Next question. <laughs> You have time for one more question, so I don't want first one, first serve. Well, if it's a quick one, maybe two, sir. Right. This is a quick one. Um, Adrian Macy from Victoria University. I, th I recall that the, there's a current government target somewhere to double the value of our agriculture exports by I'm not sure what year. Could I just ask the panel's views on uh, anything that would be necessary to ensure that this growth is uh, good growth in the terms that... Carol and others were talking about. Thanks. Yes, let us start with Euro. Uh, the way we formulated the, um, increasingly formulating our advice on that issue, not only on doubling the export growth, but also on increasing our growth in general, uh, as well as the other facets of the business growth agenda, is uh, trying to formulate it in the living standards kind of area. But as of now, uh, to be totally candid, as I said at the beginning, it's very early days. Um, so it's not playing very much into uh, the actual decisions right now. It's very early days on that basis. Ben? Uh, clearly, it's a, I we need a, an emphasis on value rather than volume. Uh, and there's much that we can do to extract more value from uh, our agricultural production. Uh, but I'd also say that uh, with existing tools and up better uptake of a whole range of existing on-farm tools, we can get more production while reducing uh, the footprint of the industry. And on, a, on an input versus output basis, uh, the productivity of the agricultural sector over the last 20 years has been uh, actually better than many other parts of the economy. And we are getting a lot more milk for uh, less inputs uh, than we were 20-odd uh, years ago. Jonathan? Well, I would say this objective is only realistic in something that could be supported if we have a proper system of pricing externalities. And if we, if, if we don't, if we don't properly price the damage that agriculture is doing to our waterways, if we don't properly price the impact of methane and you know, nitrous oxide and so on in terms of uh, climate change, if, if, we don't, if we don't build other relevant negative externalities into the pricing, then, then th this particular objective could be, you know, highly, highly damaging. So, um, that would be my view. My, my general view is, as Clutton outlined, is that we should use a, a range of um, market and non-market instruments to ensure that we we get the right kind of price signals into the uh, into the decision making of of business. Now, the, the the real challenge of this, Kim, is the political economy one. The the challenge is how to get governments to implement. Uh, these sorts of instruments in realistic ways uh, against strong opposition. And as, as uh, James rightly pointed out, um, adopting collaborative mechanisms uh, can be uh, one way of trying to achieve that, um, that, that goal 
Uh, and I'm very much hopeful that the, you know, the, the Land and Water Forum will end up generating some really positive outcomes in the, in the water area where we've struggled for decades. But, but we, we need to get on with it. You know, we, we can't sit around um, twiddling our thumbs. Mm. I want to come back to uh, when you look at a thing differently, the thing itself changes. And in a sense that it has happened in a little bit in the ag agricultural sector where effluent was a nuisance, it was disposed of and then it w needed to be managed. And now it's turned around and that effluent is now a product. And it, so there are ways to do it. We need to go much further with that. Not just talk about milk solids. We need to talk about the ecosystem services. We need to see that landscape in a far more diverse way and have that social contract going. Um, I also wanted to say collaboration is really good. And gosh, I've done it for the last 25 years and set up participatory processes. I find myself now a bit cautious when we say collaboration on one hand and on the other hand, we don't have the structure right and we're leaving it up to inventing it. So we have to really look at what is the accountability, the ability to account for collaborations in that social const uh, contract. And if I just may, I see it pipe me in this way. Uh, I think we need different property rights regimes. We have that co dialogue constantly between the private property rights and then the public property rights. We need to start thinking about common assets mm -hmm. and common, you know, that is something that, that harmonizes us. That is where we can talk about the ecosystem services and it becomes a whole different conversation at that well, point. Well, you have to rewrite the tragedy of the commons then, wouldn't you? Sorry, well, don't go there, I haven't got time. <laughs> He's been standing there patiently and so I've got to let him ask, make it really fast though. Thanks, Kim. Uh, William Ralston uh, from Fair Farmers. How are you, Farmers. William? Um, well, thanks, Kim. Uh, actually, I came up to ask this question because I thought the first question wasn't properly answered, but I think the second round is... Um, has done quite a good job at answering the first question, but I, I'm going to... So you're going to waste our time now? No, I'm not going to waste your time. Okay. Um, uh, from a farming perspective, um, you know, we, we dumped subsidies in, um, in the 80s and uh, don't want to go back to subsidies uh, that distort the market and, and uh, change um, production. Uh, but at the same time, in New Zealand, we seem to have a, a culture of, um, of penalties. And when you put penalties in place, you build resentment, and people who resent things don't tend to do what you want them to do. So my question really is, um, how do we go about um, putting in a system that doesn't just create penalties, but actually creates incentives for people to do um, the things that need to be done in terms of the environment, and how do you take them along in that journey? Thank you, good question. Who would like to respond? Yes, please. <laughs> I think it's about framing uh, the, the, the positive actions on behalf of the community as being investments on their behalf so that there is a, a constituency uh, within the community for uh, putting taxation, uh, whether it be through rating or whether it be uh, through general taxation, into initiatives that incent behavioural change. And for me, that's about a partnership in the agricultural sector between uh, urban and rural New Zealand. And that's about getting away from this idea that we blame those dairy farmers, it's their fault, uh, while we sit very smug uh, in town drinking our milk and using all of our imported goods without recognising that we actually have a collective responsibility and that our well-being stands and falls with them. And that's where I think New Zealand needs to get to after 20 odd years of being involved in debates around these issues and attending conferences like this. Uh, I think there is a real risk that we think that it's relatively simple if we can just convince people, uh, decision makers, the public, uh, that the, the, the errors of their ways. We actually have to get past that and we actually have to work together. Thank you. Quickly. Oh, look, just to say, we, we also have to be very clear that we should not allow anyone, farmers or anyone, to impose losses on the public, on the commons, on, the, on, the, on, the, you know, on, on ecosystems, uh, willy-nilly, you know, and call them penalties, call them what you like. We, 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 have, to, we have to constrain uh, the damage that people do to, uh, to the commons. And in some cases, that can be done uh, through collaborative processes and goodwill. But in many cases, it's going to require prices and, and regulation. Farmers are people too. And there are good farmers, and there are farmers that just simply are not with the program. So there's a, there's a bell curve, if you will. Work with the ones that, and really help the ones that get it. There's a whole lot of laggards in between. And then there's the tail end that just don't get it. Those have to be cut. <gasps> and that's, you know. All right, Sorry. my uncle's <laughs> capital punishment of bad farmers. 
I hope we've learned a lot. We've never Goodbye. got enough time. I look forward to seeing you all this afternoon. We have learned, if nothing else, that to incent is now a verb. Thanks <laughs> to the panel. See you later. Is it? <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Thank you, panel members. Thank you, everyone who contributed this morning. What a great start. Uh, lunch awaits. We've got about the same time for lunch that we had for morning tea, a bit over half an hour. So please remember we do need to be efficient. Remember both entrances. Remember to keep moving where possible. Remember you can bring your lunch back in here. Uh, and we will aim to start again uh, sharply at 1245. If you can be in your seat a minute or two before that, it would be terrific. Thank you.